Okay, so for part two of homework 3-1, uh, we'll start off with question seven and hopefully get all the way through question 10. So a ball is attached to a string that hangs from the ceiling. So I've got a ball here on a string that's hanging from the ceiling. Draw a free body diagram of the system and label the vectors. We'll get a free body diagram in FBD. Only shows the forces acting on the object. It doesn't show anything else, right? No distances, no velocities, nothing like that. So here's my ball. Conveniently, it's a ball, so it's just a dot. Uh, obviously it stays the same. And in this case there's only two forces that act directly on that ball. Right? I've got the force of gravity which is pushing down or pulling down. And then I have the string force. I have the tension in the string that is pulling up. So I actually have the tension or the string force, whichever one you want to call that. But technically speaking we would not call this the normal force. This is not actually the normal force, and that's going to be something we look at more moving forward. But the normal force comes from a surface that is pushing up on the, on the object. In this case, the object is not resting on a surface, so there isn't any normal force pushing up on it. Right? The only thing holding it up is, again, the tension in the string. So you could either call that the string force, or you could call that just simply T for tension pulling upward. Okay, so really my free body diagram would be either this or this. Now if you wrote that as the normal force, um, obviously I understand that we just haven't talked about that as much yet. right? But in this particular case there actually is no normal force because it's not resting on a surface. Question 8 here is a good question to illustrate. Um, so you're talking about the difference between intrinsic or internal, I should say, and external forces. Okay, So you're standing on a boat, which of the following would make the boat start to move? Well, if I'm standing on the boat, and here's the mast of the boat, and all of a sudden I just start pushing on the mast of the boat, right? If all of those forces are within the system that is the boat, it's not going to cause it to go anywhere, right? I push on the boat, the boat pushes back on me, but with respect to the water, nothing happens, right? And if you, if you doubt that, pick up your feet and push on your desk and see if you go anywhere, right? But that's not actually going to do anything. So for part B, pushing on the front of the boat. Well, again, if you're standing in the boat, if I push on the front of the boat, so if I'm bending down or doing whatever, and I'm just pushing on this boat, again, I push this way, the boat pushes right back, I'm not actually gaining any motion with respect to the water. Pushing on another passenger also in the boat, again, if there's two people in the boat and you're pushing, the force is completely within the system. So all of these are examples of internal interactions that don't affect the overall motion of the boat. However, if I throw something out of the boat, so if I throw either cargo or a person out of the boat, then I'm going to cause the boat to propel forward. So if I've got the boat here, as I throw something or someone overboard, then there's that equal and opposite push. So as I throw this out, there's actually a push on the boat moving forward. Okay, And that's really the idea of propulsion. That's the idea of how kind of rockets can work in space is they can eject uh, mass or matter outward and then propel themselves forward. So this is actually going to be a concept we come back to again and again throughout the year. Um, but it's a good way to introduce the difference between internal and external forces. As we throw something away from the boat, it's actually then an external force to the boat. Okay, so for part A of this question, they asked me to draw a free body diagram of this spacecraft. Um, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time drawing a nice spacecraft. I'll just use a dot. Right? There's actually two different two different answers I would accept for this. If you took this to mean the exact moment that it is lifting off from the ground, then technically you could have a force that is the thrust going upward, so I'll call that F of T, and you would also have a little bit of a normal force pushing upward as well. right? And then the only force pulling downward would be, would be then the force due to gravity. Okay, So all of those are going up to that dot there, the force due to gravity pulling down, the thrust and the normal force pushing up. Right. So again, that's one situation in which I could have. I would actually want to be careful, though. My normal force and the force due to gravity would be equal and opposite at the time of liftoff. Right. So my force due to gravity is about the same length here of the normal force. The other option, though, and this is really what I was intending with the question, as it's lifting off of the ground, so once it's free from the ground, the only two forces acting would be the force from the thrust and then the force due to gravity. Okay, so again, those would be the only two forces acting on it. I do need to make it very clear that the force from the thrust is bigger 
than the force due to gravity because it's lifting off. It's going off of the ground. Okay, so again, either of these technically will work for the free body diagram. This was really the diagram that I was intending with this question. But anyway, hopefully those both make sense. For part B, what is the weight of the space shuttle? Well, again, that's not too bad because they give me the mass of the space shuttle. So if I want to find the weight, it's just force of gravity. So it's just the mass, 2.0 times 10 to the 6. And then I take that times the acceleration due to gravity. Right? I'm just taking my mass times gravity. So the weight, the weight ends up being about 19,000, excuse me, 19 million 600,000 newtons. So my weight of the spacecraft here is 19,600 newtons. Okay, so I've got part B, not too bad. And then part C, this is the part that I know people tend to have some trouble with. This is the part that historically I've seen uh, students in the past often overgeneralize a little bit too much. Okay, so for part C, if I want to find the acceleration of this, the shuttle when it's launched, I need to consider not just the force equals mass times acceleration, but I need to consider this is the net force. Okay, so the most common mistake that I see is we do 1.3 times 10 to the 8th equals mass times acceleration. The problem with that is the 1.3 times 10 to the 8th is not the net force. In order to decide the actual acceleration of the space shuttle, I need to figure out what the net force is. Well, to find the net force is easy enough. If I look at this diagram, the net force is simply the force of the thrust going upward minus the force of gravity, the weight of the shuttle pulling down. And I have both of those numbers to work with. So my net force is actually 1.3 times 10 to the 8th minus my 1.96 times 10 to the 7th, minus my 19,600,000. Okay, so all I'm doing, again, is I'm first finding my net force. So that net force ends up being about 1.10, or 1.104, if you would rather, times 10 to the 8th. So then I use my net force equal to force equals mass times acceleration. So my net force equals mass times acceleration. So 1.10 times 10 to the 8th equals the mass of the space shuttle, which I know is, again, because they gave me up there, 2 times 10 to the 6th, and then I can find my acceleration. So solving for this acceleration, we get about 55.2 meters per second squared. Okay, so if you got something closer to 65, it's because you didn't correctly use the net force. Um, and I do need to make sure force equals mass times acceleration. Really, unless they tell me otherwise, I'm always using the net force for that equation. So then question 10 here, last question, is one that's trying to make sure you are paying attention. The units here are very important, 3.45 grams, but we actually want kilograms. So we need to divide that by 1,000. And so we actually have a 0 0.00345 kilogram hockey puck at rest on the table. And the reason I say this is testing you to see kind of if you're paying attention is a lot of these numbers are going to seem ridiculously big, but that's okay. <clears throat> so anyway, for part A, they want me to find the acceleration on the puck. Well, that's not too bad because they give me the net force and they give me the mass of the puck. So again, the net force equals mass times acceleration. My net force is 85 newtons, which is very, very large considering it's acting on a 0 .00345 kilogram puck. So yes, this acceleration does end up being a huge number, right? And in fact, that acceleration ends up being about 24,600. Okay, so again, my acceleration ends up being 24,638 if I actually don't round it off yet. So I've got the acceleration of the puck. So then for part B, so then for part B, they asked me to find the speed of the puck after 1.10 seconds. Well, we'll assume that it's starting at rest. So my initial velocity, my initial velocity here is zero. The time is 1.1 seconds. And the acceleration is a mere 24,638. Right. So it's going to be moving pretty quickly. And in fact, if I just set up my VOTAT, my velocity as a function of time, I'm going to see that it's moving very quickly. Right. So the velocity equals... 0 plus the acceleration 24,638 times 1.1 seconds. So my final velocity after 1.1 seconds ends up being about 27,100 or so uh, meters per second. 
Okay, so my final velocity ends up being moving pretty quick. And then finally, the horizontal distance from the edge of the table where the puck strikes the ground, where the puck strikes the deck just indicating it's hit the ground. Okay, so while this is, again, you're going to get some ridiculously large numbers, it is a very good question for us to make sure we understand. So here's my table. As the puck leaves the table, it's moving horizontally. It's going to fall down and it's going to strike the distance, um, some fairly large distance away since that number is so fast. Right. But anyway, I know the height of the table they told me is 85 centimeters, and it is important that I go ahead and convert that to meters, so 0.85 meters. Right. So I've got the height of the table, and then if I want to find the horizontal distance, right, I know that V, the horizontal velocity equals delta x over t, so I need my horizontal velocity, which I already have, and I need my time. I need to figure out how long it's going to take the puck to fall down. So I've got my change in height, because I know how high the table is. I know my acceleration due to gravity is 9.80 meters per second squared. And I know my initial vertical velocity, again being the key here, my initial vertical component is zero. Because when the puck leaves the table, yes, it's moving very fast, but all of that is horizontal. All right? So finding the time, really not too bad. Delta y equals v sub zero t plus one half at squared. Solving for the time, my initial velocity is zero. My height is 0.85. My acceleration is 9.8, so half of that is 4.9. So then solving for t. So I get my time to be about 0 0.416 seconds. And once I have that time again, at this point, hopefully it's pretty easy. I got, I've got my horizontal velocity from the part before. I have my time. It's just bringing it all together. So 27,100 equals delta x over my time of 0 0.416. And solving for delta x, we get a very large, um, I get about 11,300 Again, that's going to vary a little bit depending on where you rounded it. Um, but anyway, so I get some ridiculously large numbers. Obviously not a realistic context here, um, but it is still good to be confident enough with the calculations and the concepts to make sure you're comfortable working through this. Um, anyway, if you have any questions over anything from this homework, don't hesitate to let me know. Again, if there are questions that give you trouble, come find me so I can give you some more practice or so I can help you further explain these a little bit more.